Speaking about the multinodular goiter as regards the clinical presentation, it may be completely asymptomatic. Sometimes it may be discovered by chance during doing uh, uh, neck sonography, for example. It may be detected by chance. It may be asymptomatic or it may cause cosmotic disfigurement if the patient observes that the neck is cosmotically unsightly, enlarged thyroid gland causing just cosmotic disturbance, or it may be presenting by complications. So the question, what are the complications of multinodular goiter or simple multinodular goiter SMNG? What are the complications? Number one, cystic degeneration. What's the risk of cystic degeneration? Sometimes hemorrhage may occur in a cyst and this is called thyroid apoplexy. Exactly like brain apoplexy, hemorrhage inside cyst in the brain or hemorrhage inside a tumor uh, of the brain, this may cause sudden increase of intracranial tension exactly in the thyroid. Hemorrhage inside a cyst may cause thyroid apoplexy with sudden enlargement of the nodule, with sudden discomfort or sometimes suffocation. This is called thyroid apoplexy thyroid apoplexy. So, number one, cystic degeneration. Number two, hemorrhage inside a nodule or inside a cyst. It is called thyroid apoplexy. Number three, calcification. And calcification sometimes may be mixed for a tumor because calcification is filled as a hard nodule or a hard consistency of the gland. So, it may be mistaken for a malignancy. Thyro toxicosis or what we call secondary toxic changes in 30 percent it may turn into toxic and the toxicity source of toxicity may be one of two either just one nodule it is called autonomously active nodule or diffuse from the internodular tissue diffuse process which is plumber disease so toxicity in 30 percent of cases what about mal malignant transformation and usually the malignant transformation of the simple multinodular goiter turns into follicular type of thyroid cancer, follicular thyroid cancer, in just 5%. So toxic changes in 30%, but malignant transformation in 5% only. And the last complication is compression manifestation. The goiter may enlarge enough to cause compression manifestations or may show what we call retrosternal extension. Sometimes the whole gland may descend into the superior mediastinum causing what we call mediastinal syndrome. This is compression manifestations. Question, what are the compression manifestations you know? Number one, compression on the airway. So the trachea is compressed. Sometimes, as we see in this photo, the trachea may be just slit. It's called the slit trachea or sward, sward-like trachea, sward trachea with great dyspnea. And the question here, what are the types of dyspnea in thyroid disorders? Number one, postural dyspnea. It is related to posture. Patient cannot lie down and uh, 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 the patient lie usually in a semi-sitting position. It's called postural dyspnea. It is related to compression. But the other type of dyspnea is exertional dyspnea. And usually the exertional dyspnea is related to hyperdynamic state. It is associated with toxic goiter. So two types of dyspnea in the thyroid disorders. Number one, postural dyspnea with compression. Number two, exertional dyspnea. It is with hyperdynamic state in a case of, uh, in a cases of toxic goiter. So compression on the airway results in compression on the airway results in dyspnea, which is hmm, postural dyspnea. Number two, compression on the digestive way, the pharynx or the esophagus causes dysphagia. So dyspnea, dysphagia, compression on the recurrent laryngeal nerve causes hoarseness of voice, compression on the neck veins or on the superior mediastinum, on the uh, veins coming to the heart, results in what we call mediastinal syndrome. Mediastinal syndrome, as we see in this photo, dilated veins all over the manubrium sterni, 
puffness of the face, puffness of the eyelids, plethoric facies, and of course there is dyspnea due to decreased venous return from the upper way. This is called superior mediastinal syndrome or mediastinal syndrome. And lastly, compression on the arteries of the neck that may result in dizziness and pulse unequality on both sides. So in a case of thyroid disorder, you must measure the pulse on both sides to see equality on both sides. If there is compression on one side, it may lead to unequal pulse on both sides. These are compression manifestations. And the next question, what are the signs and symptoms suggestive of malignant transformation? Again, we say that malignant transformation occurs in 5% of cases. What are the symptoms and signs of malignant transformation? Number one, and the most important one, is rapid increase of size. Actually, the multinodular goiter or simple multinodular go goiter may last for several years, up to 20 years, for example. But sudden increase of size with a, with a rapid progressive course, this may draw your attention of malignant transformation. Number two, the hard consistency. Hard consistency. And instead of being, for example, soft or firm, the appearance of hard consistency may draw your attention of malignant transformation. Presence of pain after being painless, it is now painful. It's now painful. Presence of compression manifestation, as we mentioned. Presence of new compression manifestations. For example, hoarseness of voice, dysphagia, dyspnea, mediastinal uh, syndrome, uh, dizziness and pulse inequality. This may draw your attention of malignant transformation. Fixity of the gland after being mobile, now it is fixed. Starting to ulcerate and fungate. Presence of or, or new development of lymph node enlargement, lymph node metastasis or distant metastasis, for example, pulmonary metastasis or whatever. All these are signs and, and symptoms suggestive of malignant transfer, transformation. What's the most important one? Rapid increase of size. This is very, very important. Then appearance of lymph node metastasis and so on. So these are signs and symptoms that that suggests malignant transformation, at least shift to investigations. What are the investigations can I do for this case? Of course, of course, of course, laboratory investigations, assessment of thyroid hormone, uh, three, T3 and T4 and TSH, of course, to exclude the hmm, toxic, toxic state. Sometimes with laboratory assessment, is to do thyroglobulin to exclude malignancy, for example. Of course, the other lab is very important also, but let's shift to the radiology. As we see here, this is a photo for just X-ray. And we can observe in this X-ray what we call broadening of the mediastinum. Broadening of the superior mediastinum is an indication of retrosternal extension. Broadening of the superior mediastinum may be caused by the uh, retrosternal extension. Sometimes I can see calcification of the thyroid and there is minute punctic calcification of malignancy, but the coarse calcification usually of benign nature, either, either blotchy calcifications or uh, curvilinear calcifications, they are all benign calcifications. Then the most important investigation is the thyroid ultrasound and CT. And the thyroid ultrasound can show the multiple uh, uh, nodules, can show the cystic areas, can show the areas of hemorrhage, can show the vascularity, the uptake, the lymph node status, the uh, uh, stigma of malignant transformation and so on. So ultrasound is a crucial investigation. Then VCT can show the airway compression, can ensure the data given by the ultrasound, and we can do metastatic work up in a case of malignant suspicion. These all are the radiologic investigations, and in a case of suspicion, I must take a biopsy. I must take a biopsy. Also, I must do endoscopic examination by indirect laryngoscope, 
to assess the airway, the vocal cords, to exclude vocal cord paralysis of or airway compression before doing operation. Now, the question, what's the treatment? What's the treatment? In the previous table, treatment of physiologic goiter is just thyroxine replacement. Treatment of colloid goiter, if it is a moderate, moderate increase of the thyroid gland, just thyroxine replacement. But if it is large enough to cause cosmetic disfigurement and so on, so we can do thyroidectomy. Treatment of the multinodular goiter. It is long standing, for example, not causing any cosmetic disfigurement, not causing any complications. I can conserve, I can leave the patient, I can give replacement thyroxine. Speaking about the indications of surgery for the multinodular goiter, we can uh, summarize them into five or whatever, five C's, five C's. Number one, cosmotic disfigurement, cosmotic disfigurement. Number two, compression manifestation. Any compression manifestation equals surgery, compression manifestation. Cystic degeneration, calcification, cancer suspicion, cancer suspicion, changing into toxic goiter. Usually, primary toxic goiter is a medical disease, can be treated by either medications or radioactive iodine, but secondary toxic goiter is a surgical disease because of fibrosis and hemorrhage and cystic formation. It is it will be respond uh, 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 slightly to medical and usually failure will occur. So surgery is the main line of treatment, but medication is for preparation to decrease toxicity till I do total thyroidectomy. In the past, surgery was either partial thyroidectomy or subtotal thyroidectomy. Nowadays, the main line of treatment is total thyroidectomy, never to leave thyroid tissue. Otherwise, it may develop malignancy later on or may develop another toxicity later on. So the main line of treatment is total thyroidectomy. Lastly, wishing you a much of luck and the best of luck. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.